Hello, everyone. Hey, it's time for a little more general chemistry. Let's talk today about solids, liquids, and gases. The three states of matter. I guess there's also a fourth one, aqueous. Or some people say there's a fifth one, plasma. But let's focus on solids, liquids, and gases. And talk about changing between those, those states, changes of states. <laughs> and then also intermolecular forces. We'll put that in there at the end of the video. OK. So this is true for all molecules. Molecules can exist as solids, liquids, and gases. Let's look at water, because that might be one of the most familiar uh, molecules that we know of. And um, well, you know the three states <laughs> for, where's the pen, there it is. For uh, water, uh, the solid state, there it goes, is also known as ice. Liquid state, that's known as water. And the gas state, that's known as steam. OK, so familiar, we have different names for the different phases of water. What's the chemical formula for water? H2O. What's the chemical formula for ice? H2O. What's the chemical formula for steam? Yeah, H2O. OK, so we're not changing the identity of the molecule, but it sure looks like we are, right? This form of water is cold and solid and hard. Uh, this form of water is splashy, liquidy. <laughs> I don't know what you want to call it. And that appears much differently than steam, which can give you a burn, right? Um, very different forms, but it's all water. So from a chemical point of view, what's happening? Well, we can transform water into these different states by adding heat energy. And we can measure the amount of heat energy in some cases by measuring the temperature. Right, so if you start with ice, really, really cold, put in some heat, it'll change to liquid water. Put in more heat, it can change to gas or steam. Now, if we pay a little bit more attention as we're adding heat, we can also measure the temperature. And let's say we go into the refrigerator or freezer compartment, pull out a really cold piece of ice. And if you ever notice that sometimes the ice sticks to your fingers, well, what's happening is that the ice in the freezer is actually below zero degrees, the freezing point or melting point of water. Maybe it's at negative 20 degrees Celsius. And so when you pick up with your bare fingers, you might have a little moisture on your skin and the ice is so cold, negative 20, it'll freeze the moisture on your skin and turn it to ice. And now you got one big piece of ice between your fingers, right? The, piece of, the ice cube you grab, well, then freeze the, the water on your fingers and freeze all together and your fingers stick to it. And give it a few seconds. The blood will pump through your fingers, warm up your skin and melt that little layer of ice on your fingertips. Okay, grab that piece of ice, maybe with gloves, <laughs> leave it on the counter, put a thermometer next to it and you can watch the temperature of the ice go from minus 20 up to zero. Maybe freeze the thermometer inside the ice cube, whatever you choose. But it turns out you can warm up ice from minus 20 to zero and it remains a solid. Only until you hit zero degrees does it begin to change from solid to liquid. And you can watch as you steadily put in more and more heat energy, all that heat energy goes into changing solid to liquid. All the heat energy goes into melting the ice, but the temperature doesn't increase not until all the ice has been melted and changed to liquid water. At that point, you add more heat energy and now the temperature rises. That's kind of cool. So it kind of makes sense though. So all the heat energy goes to changing the temperature if you're not changing the physical state. Cold ice, add some heat, it goes from minus 20 up to zero. It changes its temperature without changing its state. But if you're changing the solid to a liquid, you're changing the state. All the heat and energy goes and changes solid to liquid and the temperature does not change. The temperature remains constant at zero degrees. It's a flat curve if you're plotting the temperature change versus heat added. But once you melt it all, the, the water starts out at zero degrees. If you could chill it, it would freeze again but now you're gonna warm it up. Add some more heat energy to the cold water at zero degrees, and it warms up to 20, then the 40, and the 60. The more heat you add, the hotter it gets, the temperature rises. 
until you hit the magic temperature for water, which is 100 degrees. Keep adding more heat and the temperature doesn't go above 100. But where does the heat energy go? It goes to boiling. It changes the liquid water into a gas, into steam. And it takes a long time to change all the water molecules from liquid to gaseous water molecules, steam. So you heat a long time, keep putting a lot of heat energy, the temperature never changes until all the liquid has evaporated as a gas. And now if you had a sealed container and you kept heating this, then the steam could actually heat up beyond 100 degrees. You could warm up the steam even hotter. So the lesson here is, you know, if you're cooking some spaghetti and you're boiling a pot of water and you got the flame on full, that's supposed to be a flame. <laughs> I can't draw. You have a, you know, a gas stove and you're turning the flame on full and this is boiling like crazy. What's the temperature in there? 100 degrees. Someone else is conserving energy and has a little flame going. So in their pot of spaghetti, we're getting some boiling, make sure it's still boiling. As long as it's boiling, the temperature is still 100 degrees. Your spaghetti's not gonna cook any faster if it's bubbling slowly or bubbling like crazy. You think it would, because the, look, the heat is so much higher. The problem is the heat doesn't go into the spaghetti noodles to cook them. No, all the heat goes into the water and changes the water from liquid to gas. The temperatures remain the same at 100 degrees. That's what this data says. Okay. That's changes of state and changing the temperature when you don't change the state, right? So if you have cold ice, you can warm it up. If you have liquid water, you can warm it up. If you have a gas, you can warm it up. Add heat, temperature changes. Oh, we can do the reverse, right? So you take some steam and you remove heat energy, you cool it down and you change it back into liquid water. Take a long time to do that but you can do it. And after you have hot water, you can cool it down, remove heat energy until you bring it to zero and you can start freezing it. And as you're removing heat energy, the cold water stays at zero. You're removing heat energy, cooling it, cooling it, but the temperature doesn't drop below zero until it's, in com it's completely frozen at zero degrees. Once it's frozen, you can cool it more and now the temperature will drop below zero. And it turns out energy is conserved. So we got some calculations here. If we have one gram of H2O, one gram, and we start at negative 20 degrees, one gram of ice, it takes 9.6 calories to warm it up to zero. And then we can take that one gram of ice at zero degrees and add 80 calories and it'll melt it. But still the liquid water is at zero degrees. And then what you can do with very cold water, you can warm it up to 100 degrees by adding 100 calories of heat. If you want to boil it, that one gram of water needs 540 calories to change into one gram of steam. And if you want to raise it up to 120 degrees from 100 degrees, it's going to take 9.6 calories. So how much heat energy do you need to remove from steam at 120 to bring it down to 100. Same amount, energy is conserved. We might say, hey, it's a negative 9.6 calories, meaning we have to remove it, take it away. If you want to condense steam back to liquid, you'd have to remove 540 calories of heat. Take the one gram of steam and bring it down to one gram of water. Anyways, whatever you calculate to go in the forward direction, same value in the opposite direction. Energy is conserved. All right, that's a good basis here. What are some take home messages? Um, ooh, let's think about things on a molecular level. So we got the same diagram essentially. We got solid, let's still talk about water, but it applies to any molecule. We'll have solid ice, the water molecules, which are these circles are all frozen in place. We have liquid water right here, and that's where all the water molecules are still sticking together. It's all puddled up at the bottom of the flask or beaker or on the floor if you spill some water. <laughs> and 
And um, sometimes the water molecules unstick from their neighbors as they bounce around, and move around. But most of the time, the water molecules are all stuck to their neighbors, but not in an orderly fashion, like in a solid. And in a solid, they may vibrate in place, but for the most part, the liquid mo water molecules can diffuse and move around from one side of the puddle to the other. Over here, we have a gas. Well, now we have individual water molecules. Water molecules are now unstuck from their neighbors. Well, occasionally, maybe two of them might collide and temporarily stick together, but then they move around so much, they have so much energy, they can unstick again. So something could collide with this and separate these two. So this is the idea. And then how do you condense gas back to liquid? You need to slow them down so that they can re-stick together. And how you change liquid to ice or liquid to solid? Um, you still have to slow them down. You have to cool them off so that now they remain stuck in place as a solid. So here's the take home messages. As you apply more heat energy, you're actually giving the molecules more energy to move. And the motion, molecular motion can take place as a vibration, uh, it could be spinning, it could be bounce around. Translational energy is the, the term. What else? Vibrational, translational, rotational, probably something else. We you say spinning, that's rotation. Anyways, they move more. And the more energy that you give them, the faster they move. What causes the phases? Well, molecules move faster with more energy, but they also are just naturally sticky. Um, water tends to stick to water really well. And that's true for all molecules although the degree of stickiness isn't the same. Um, some, some molecules don't stick together, stick together very, very well at all. A good example is dry ice. So that's supposed to be a cube, <laughs> ugly cube, of solid carbon dioxide called dry ice. And what happens, um, carbon dioxide, when it's super cold, will freeze in place as a solid, dry ice. And as it warms up, it skips liquid phase, right? So if you can zoom in and look at the molecules that make up a piece of dry ice, you'll see the little molecules of CO2 stuck together, stuck in place, not moving very much. And as it warms up, suddenly the molecules unstick from the neighbors and jump right into the gas phase. The term for that is sublime. The solid sublimes to the gas phase, sublimation, if you want the noun. And it's kind of cool. You put it in a punch bowl and, and during Halloween, and it looks like it's fuming, like witch's brew, whatever. Um, and what you're seeing is you know, carbon dioxide as a solid turning to gas and creating those vapors that you see coming out. And the reason why it doesn't stop at the liquid phase is that carbon dioxide is a nonpolar molecule. Remember when we talked about polar covalent bonds? The carbon oxygen bond is a polar covalent bond because oxygen is more electronegative than carbon. And if oxygen is more electronegative, it's pulling on the bonding electrons more than carbon pulls back, becoming slightly positive. Yeah, but this oxygen is doing the same thing. And it's sort of like a tug of war. And the, the pulling, the, the draw, withdrawing of the electrons kind of cancels out. Or in other words, both sides of this molecule is slightly negative. It's not polarized. It's not like one side slightly positive, another side slightly negative. This is a nonpolar molecule. And it turns out polar molecules tend to be very sticky, like water. Um, water is slightly negative. The hydrogen is slightly positive. So this side is slightly positive. This side of the water molecule is negative. And then if you have another water molecule over here, slightly positive, opposites attract. So because the molecules are polar, polar means one side of the molecule is slightly positive, another side is slightly negative, and opposites attract, they tend to stick together pretty well. In fact, if you have an OH or an NH bond, it can stick together really well in a sticky force called hydrogen bonding. More on that later. Anyways. Carbon dioxide is not very sticky because it's nonpolar. It's greasy or waxy. 
those are nonpolar molecules. And so it sublimes really easily. Water is very sticky. It can hydrogen bond. So as you heat up the water and they move faster, they'll unstick from the solid block, but then they'll still kind of still stick together as a liquid add more heat energy, and then now they can unstick from the neighbors and bounce up into the atmosphere as a gas, as steam. So essentially, phase changes, solids change into liquids, liquids change the gases, or the reverse, is really just this interplay, the result of molecular motion versus intermolecular forces. Um, intermolecular forces is just a general term for saying how sticky these molecules are, how, how much do they stick together? Um, how strong are the forces inter between molecules that makes them stick together? Cool. And then bottom line here, phase changes don't change the chemical formula, right? I had some students say, wait, when you boil water, it turns into hydrogen gas and oxygen gas. And I say, well, you can test that. You can put a match in the steam over your, your stove when you're boiling up your spaghetti noodles. Um, if that was true, you'd blow up the kitchen. Hydrogen gas is explosive. Oxygen makes a fire burn. And so water, when it changes steam, does not turn into hydrogen gas and oxygen gas. No, um, turns into water as steam, gaseous water. Cool. Okay, energy calculations. Oh, right. So we talked about conceptually. Now, what's the concept here? What's, what's happening in a phase change? And I hope you have a good understanding of that. Molecules tend to stick together. If they're really strong intermolecular forces, materials can stay solid at warm temperatures. And at more temperature, they're trying to move, but the intermolecular force is holding them together, keeps them bound as a solid until you give it enough energy, raise the temperature enough to make those molecules vibrate in place that they can unstick, turn into liquid, heat them more, make them move even faster, so then they can unstick from the other neighbors and become individual molecules as a gas. Now we wanna do some math on this. Let's calculate it. We got all these numbers, 100, 540 and stuff. How did we get those? Well, here are the equations over here. I'll give you these, but you can see that there's three equations. All right, I'll put this so we can see stuff. Here we go. Um, here's equation number one, equation number two, and equation number three. So you have to know which equation to use depending on which calculation you want to perform. Okay, three equations, but it's really that are two that are similar and one that's very different. And it has to do with the fact that sometimes when you add energy, or add heat energy, the temperature will change. When's that happen? It's when you're not changing it from a solid to a liquid or a liquid to a gas. It means you're just warming something up. If it's already a solid, you're just changing the temperature of that solid. So all the heat energy goes into changing the temperature. If you have a liquid, and you warm it up and it's still liquid, or you take a hot liquid and cool it down to cool liquid, all your heat energy you're adding or removing goes to temperature. Same with the gas. You start with gas, end with the gas, maybe you heat up the gas or you cool down the gas, all the heat energy goes in changing the temperature. So we need an equation where temperature is changing. And here it is. So if you don't have a phase change, all you're doing is changes to the temperature, then your equation is, how much heat do you need? Well, it depends on how much material you have, right? So if you put a cup of coffee in the microwave versus putting a pitcher of coffee in the microwave, it's gonna take a lot more energy to warm it up, right? So how much material you have affects how much heat you need to change its temperature. We need a conversion factor because mass is, is in grams and heat is in calories usually. And the conversion factor is called specific heat. Good name, because the, the conversion factor is specific for your material. So if you change from wax, from you know trying to heat up water in the microwave and you try to heat up wax, trying to melt chocolate, let's say, it's a different conversion factor. Um, and then of course, how hot 
or how much of a temperature change do you want? Do you just want to take a warm cup of coffee and make it a little warmer? You don't need much heat. But if it's ice cold coffee and you want it steaming hot, that's a big change in temperature that requires more heat. So this equation will calculate how much heat energy and calories that you need. As long as you have the mass of your liquid, solid, or gas, whatever you're trying to change the temperature to, and you have to go and look it up. You don't have to memorize it. Look up the specific heat, the conversion factor. And then you also have to figure out, well, what's your starting temperature and ending temperature? The change in temperature, delta T. And it's defined as the final mass initial. If you do this, then you automatically get the correct sign. Meaning if your final temperature is hotter than your initial, then a big number minus a little number gives you a positive number. But if you're cooling something down, you can still use this equation to figure out how much heat do you have to remove? But now you start at a hot temperature. Initially, it's going to be a big number. And you want to go colder. Your final temperature will be smaller. And you take a little number, like, I don't know, 20, and subtract from a big number, like 100. So if you're trying to cool something from 100 degrees down to 20, well, 20 minus 100 is a negative 80. That's a change in temperature. And now you get a minus sign. Multiply it times specific eight, multiply it times the mass. You're going to get a negative Q, negative heat. And that makes sense. You're removing this heat, this heat. You're not adding it to the system. You're trying to lower the temperature by taking it out. And that's why you get a negative value for the amount of heat, the Q value. I don't know why it's called Q. Chemists and physicists just decide on the Q. I'm not sure about the physicists. Anyways, chemists like Q for heat. Okay, different game plan though, if you're melting something or you're boiling something. Different game plan, if you're freezing something or you're condensing something. Condensing means take the gas, make it a liquid. You're doing a phase change if you're melting, boiling, freezing, or condensing. When you're phase changing, you can't change the temperature. All the temperature change, all the heat rather, yeah, you're adding heat to melt it or boil it. All the heat you're adding doesn't change the temperature. It goes to changing it from solid to liquid. At the molecular level, you're adding more motion to the molecules so they can unstick. So ice, change the liquid, all the heat energy you add moves the molecules faster so they unstick from the ice cube and become a puddle of water, still at zero degrees. If you're boiling water, all the heat you go in that, add, that you add goes to moving the molecules faster so they can unstick from their neighbors and jump into the atmosphere and steam. Right. Keep moving. <laughs> okay. So you don't change the temperature. So your equation should not have a temperature value in it because the change of temperature is going to be zero. Don't use this equation if you're changing states. So whether you change from a solid to liquid or liquid to solid, what does that mean? Solid to liquid means you're melting it. Liquid to solid means you're freezing it. And water freezes and melts at the same temperature, zero degrees. Doesn't matter which way you're going. This is the equation you want. You just need to know, need to know how much material you have and you need the conversion factor. It goes by a fancy name, the heat of fusion. Fusion, fusion. So if you have some metal, you might fuse it together and make a big long piece of metal. So you're taking liquids and fusing them together to make a solid. That's my rationale. Um, so how much heat does it take to undo that, to take the solid and melt it? That's the heat of fusion. And that's how much energy you have to remove to cool down liquid and refreeze it, heat of fusion. It's a value you have to look up but it's actually an easier math problem. Um, to calculate the heat, just tell me how much mass I have and I'll go look up the value for that material and I multiply the two together and I'll calculate the heat. The equation for boiling and for condensing, so liquids change the gas, means you boil it. Take the gas, change it back to liquid, you're condensing it. Same equation, just tell me how much of that liquid or gas I'm starting with, how many grams? I'll go look up the conversion factor called the heat of vaporization. Now that's a good name. The gas is like a vapor. Yeah, so if vapor is one of your states, and it is here, if you're boiling it, you change it to a vapor, 
If you're condensing it, you start with a vapor. You need the height of vapor vaporization. Go find that conversion factor, multiply times your mass, you get your, your heat. Cool. Here are the conversion factors for water. You don't have to memorize them. Just want to show you that they're changing. They're not the same. It really is specific to what you're talking about. And if you look at wax, for example, you can melt wax, you can heat up liquid wax, you can actually boil wax. You don't want to be around when that's happening. Um, you're going to coat wax molecules all over the place, but you can do it. Heat it up hot enough. And the conversion factors for calculating the heat are all different, just like it is for water. So if you want some numbers here, if you're trying to warm up ice, so you're not changing the state, it's ice at minus 20, still ice at zero, you need the specific heat of ice, which happens to be 0 0.48 with some crazy units. Why? Because the equation is this one. Change in temperature. So you want heat, which has units of calories. Well, that's good. That's specific, he has calories. But then the mass is in grams. So when you're trying to calculate the calories, we want to cancel out the grams. Specific heat has grams in the denominator. So when you multiply it times the mass, the grams will cancel out. We also need to know how much the temperature changes. And then we're going to measure the temperature in Celsius. So specific heat has that unit, Celsius, in the denominator. So when you multiply them together, Celsius cancels out and it leaves you with calories, which is the units we want for heat. So don't get you know, scared by these crazy units. It's just there to make the units work out correctly. Cancel out the ones we start with and change it into one we want, calories. Okay, um, if you're melting the ice, ooh, that's a phase change. Start with solid ice, make it liquid water. Your conversion factor, the heat of fusion, is 80 calories per gram. Why doesn't it have Celsius in the denominator? Because it's a different equation. The heat of fusion goes here, 80 calories per gram. Multiply it times your grams, grams cancel out, you're left with calories. Same is true for the rest of them, right? Specific heat of liquid water, here we're just warming the water. It's going to look like this top equation. If you're boiling it, it's going to look like this equation, except the delta H is not fusion, it's delta H of vaporization. What about changing the temperature of steam? Well, you're not changing the phase. So now you're back up here using this equation again, but with a different specific heat, one for steam, it's 0.48. Hey, that happens to be the same as ice. I don't think that's always true depending on what material you have. I don't think that's always going to be the same. Certainly it's not the same as liquid water. All right, why don't we do a few sample calculations. Get a feel for some of, some of the problems we might see. So here are the conversion factors for water. So we can do some math. Let's try a few things. Let's, um, for my sample problems. Oh, let's melt four grams of ice. So calculate the amount of heat to melt four grams of ice. Okay, so you don't have to memorize the equation, but you have to be able to pick it out. So what are we doing? We're melting. So that's changing a solid to a liquid. That's a phase change. So we don't want the equation with the delta T in it. So here's my list. So I don't want this equation at the bottom with the delta T, the change in temperature. No, it's a phase change. So I either take M times delta H or M times delta H. Well, let's pick M times delta H. Q is M times delta H. Oh, but which delta H? Well, we're melting it from solid to liquid. Any vapor around here? No, there's no gas. Okay, then it's the other one. It's a fusion one. So we're heating the heat of fusion, right? Fusing the liquid water back to ice. The conversion factor is 80. 
So for delta H, it's 80 calories per gram. That's the value for delta H. Multiply it times the mass. Where is that? Oh, it's right here, four grams. And that gives us our value of heat, which is called Q. And we all need a calculator for this, right? Four times eight is 32. And then another zero, so 320. Calories can't, I'm sorry, grams cancel out, leaving you with calories. Yeah, that's the unit for heat or energy, calories. Nice, I like it when it's straightforward like that. All right, let's do uh, two more. Um, calculate the heat to warm up some water. Calculate the amount of heat to warm water. Let's say it's at room temperature 20 degrees. Oh, let's use our mouth to warm it up. Let's heat it up from 20 degrees to body temperature, which in Celsius is around 37 degrees Celsius. Room temperature, it's kind of a cold room, 20 degrees, maybe tap water. Um, how much? Let's add, amount, calculate the amount, the amount of heat to warm, I don't know, seven grams of water from 20 degrees up to 37. So you can lose weight, not much. Um, you can lose, burn some calories by warming up water in your mouth. Maybe eat some ice, lose some calories that way too. Yeah, it's not a great way to lose weight. Someone would have figured this out long ago, but you are using up some heat energy. Your body has to burn, metabolize in order to keep your mouth warm. So, hey, technically you're burning calories. How many calories? You can calculate it. Well, which equation do we need? We're changing the temperature. And what's our physical states? We start with warm water, well, cool water at 20, end up with warm water at 37. We're not changing the state. Good. Then we want the other equation with the delta T in it. It's specific heat as a conversion factor times delta T. Okay. So what's the mass? Seven grams. What's the conversion factor for warming up water? Well, it's right up here. Let's move this out of the way. Um, you warm up water from anywhere from between, between zero degrees and 100 degrees, the specific heat of liquid water is 1.0. Nice. And then we have crazy units. Calories are on top. I'm looking at it right here. Calories is on top. And the grams and the degree Celsius are down in the denominator. Um, you can put a little X there. Or you can just list them together. They put a dot for multiply. Whatever you want to do. And we times it times a change in temperature. And that's the final minus initial. So where's the final temperature? 37. And what's our initial? 20. Okay, scroll down a little bit so we have a little more room. 37 minus 20 is 17 degrees C times one, whoops, that's supposed to be a decimal point, calories, grams, degree C times seven. You don't necessarily have to show all your work on the exam, but maybe that's helping some students follow the math. Start on the left side here. Seven times one is seven and the grams cancel out. Then seven times 17, uh, I don't have that memorized. <laughs> that's 119. And Celsius cancels out, leaving you with calories. Okay, 119 calories. You might be saying, hey, candy bar has like 200 calories. Maybe I should drink more warm, well, cold water and burn calories that way. Well, the problem is <laughs> there's a little bit of marketing that goes into the nutrition labels on those candy bars. A food calorie is written with a capital C. These are lowercase c's because a food calorie is actually a kilocalorie. And what's a kilocalorie? Well, what's a kilometer? One kilometer is a thousand meters. What's a kilogram? It's a thousand grams. What's a kilocalorie? It's a thousand calories.
Okay, calories, sorry, not two L's. So a candy bar, if it weighs, weighs. If it has 200 calories in it, food calories, it really has 200,000 scientific calories. Yeah, melting that or warming up that water in your mouth is not taking much of a dent <laughs> off of the calories in that candy bar. Can you imagine what people would do? I wonder if that would affect our eating habits. If we didn't use the food calories and we use regular calories and said, that candy bar is actually 200,000 calories. No, thank you. 200 calories doesn't sound so bad, especially Hershey's and Reese's. Anyway, I don't have any stock of those companies. I'm not trying to advertise those. <laughs> They're yummy. Uh, last one, trick question. Why not? Oh, this way, if you see it, it's not a trick question. You know how to do it. Calculate the amount of heat to warm 15 grams of water at, what temperature did I pick? 25 degrees Celsius to steam at 120 degrees. No, I said 110. Okay, so what's happening? We're changing the water to steam. There's a phase change, but the temperature is also changing, 25 to 110. Hey, what's going on? There's three things going on. So it, you have to break it down. So you're gonna start with water at 25 degrees, and ultimately you have to change the steam at 110. But along the way, the first thing that has to happen is you need to warm up the water the really hot water just on the brink of starting the boil, but not yet. So first thing you have to do is warm up the water from 25 to 100. Once the water is at 100 degrees, now you can add more heat energy and it doesn't go up to 101, 102. Nope. All the heat energy you add at this point does the phase change. It boils off the water, changes it to steam and the steam comes out at the same temperature, 100 degrees. And all the heat you add keeps converting liquid water to gaseous water until all the liquid water is gone. And then you start with steam. All the water molecules are now steam molecules, gaseous H2O at 100 degrees. Now you have to warm up this gas to 110. Whoops, 110. <laughs> So this one problem is really three problems. That's why it's a trick question. But now you know the, the trick. Break it down so that you can apply the correct equation to each one and then add it up at the end. Okay, so we're gonna take water to water, no phase change, changing the temperature from 25 to 100, cool. That's the Q where we take the mass times some conversion factor and we need to know what the temperature change is. We can go back up and look at it. It's a specific heat one. What about this one? The temperature's not changing. So you can't use this equation. The one that has a change in temperature? No, there's no change. Don't use that equation. Instead, it's a Q times, sorry, Q equals the mass times a conversion factor. Which one? It's the heat of changing liquid to steam, liquid to gas, liquid to vapor. It's the delta H of the vapor. That's the equation we'll use. And then what about this one? You got hot steam becoming hotter steam. No phase change, gas to gas. Instead, the temperature is changing. Okay, so we need the top equation yet again. But we're gonna use a different conversion factor, the specific heat of steam, here we're using specific heat of liquid water. Yeah. Okay, and the whole question said, how much heat does it take from liquid water to steam? So to get all the heat, we want to add them up at the end. Okay. So this is the math we have to do at the end. We want the total 
heat. So we're going to add up everybody. Okay, so let's do this equation. What's the heat for? It's off screen, sorry. Um, 25 to 100 degrees. Let's leave it here. Yeah, that'll work. So the amount of heat is the mass. Oh, there it is, 15 grams. Specific heat, don't have to memorize it. Specific heat of liquid water, specific heat of liquid water. Here we go, warming up water, SH specific heat of water is one. Okay, nice math. So times one calorie divided by grams, three Celsius, times the change of temperature. The final 100 minus the initial 25. Okay, and then it's 15 times one times 75 and all our units, whoops, I left off the degree Cs. They're gonna cancel out degree Cs, grams are gonna cancel out. We're gonna be left with calories for warming up the water from 25 to 100, I calculated 1,125 calories. What about this one? Well, now we have to boil the water, vaporize it. So the mass is still 15 grams and we're vaporizing it. So the heat of vaporization for water, heat of vaporization for water is 540. By 40 grams per calories. Sorry, I was thinking molar mass. Sorry. Go back and look. It says actually calories per gram because the grams have to cancel out. 15 times 540, the Q, the heat for boiling, this 15 grams is 8,100. A lot of energy it takes to boil. And then lastly, we're going to warm up the steam. So we still have also mass times specific heat of steam times the change in temperature. Um, we still have 15 grams. Multiply it times specific heat of steams, SH of steam. There it is, the last number. SH of steam is 0 0.48. 0.48 grams, degree C. Um, oh, we have to. Grams, why do I keep doing that? Calories on top. I want the grams on the bottom to cancel out this one. And I know I reversed it, sorry. They're still getting cancel out. Uh, the change in temperature. Well, we ended or the final temperature is 110. And the initial is 100. Sorry, I should have put a little degree C. It's gonna cancel out, so it's okay. 110 minus 100 is 10. And then 10 times 15 times 0.48, let's squeeze it in here, sorry. It's only 72, 72 calories. Cool. All right, so to warm up the water so we can start boiling it, it's 1,125. To boil it, it takes 8,100 calories. To warm up the steam from 100 to 110 is 72 calories. Add those together. And I got 9,297 calories. Okay. If you want to pay attention to significant figures, this one has four sig figs, but this measurement only had two. You really should <clears throat> round down to the correct number of significant figures. Put that in parentheses, because that's what the calculator said, but really it's 9,300 calories. Let's use two sig figs. Someone else might say, that's a lot of calories. Why don't we convert that to kilocalories? Okay, you don't have to, but if you're looking at a homework answer key, sometimes the textbooks will do this without telling you. Your units will be calories. You go and look at the answer in the back of the book. It's in kilocalories, what's going on? So just remember uh, one kilogram is a thousand grams. Same true as one kilocalorie is a thousand calories. So I need to cancel the calories. So put the thousand calories down here and the one kcal up here. So the calories cancel 9,300 divided by, did I say that right? 9,300, yeah, divided by 1,000 is 
kilocalories. That's the total amount of heat to take cold water at 25 degrees and change the steam at 110. Nice. All righty, let's discuss a little bit more about intermolecular forces. Not here, it must be over here. Okay, turns out you either talk about three or four intermolecular forces. Some um, teachers will say the fourth, fourth intermolecular force is ionic bonding. That's okay if you want to do that. I think of covalent bonding, ionic bonding is kind of on the same level, very, very strong, holding atoms together to form molecules. So we'll ignore the ionic bonding and we'll just say for us, three intermolecular forces and they increase this way. So hydrogen bonding is the strongest, London dispersion is the weakest. Um, you may also have heard this force being called van der Waals forces. Um, induced dipole, dipole, maybe a couple names for the weakest force. All right, oh, what's the strongest one? Hydrogen bonding. Which molecules can hydrogen bond? Any molecule possessing an NH, an OH, or an FH bond. So here's some examples. So that's something you'll need to memorize. And I'll say, hey, ammonia, NH3, what's the strongest intermolecular force that it can do? Well, nitrogen is attached to hydrogen three times in the ammonia molecule. You only need one bond to make it capable of making a hydrogen bond. So this is a this is molecule can hydrogen bond because it has an NH bond. Is ammonia polar or nonpolar? Well, these covalent bonds are polar covalent, but they're not canceling out. If you draw the structure like this, nitrogen's tug, pulling electrons from this hydrogen and from that one, making this one slightly positive, this one slightly positive, this slightly negative. So left and right, the bonds kind of cancel out, but not up and down. Hydrogen down here is positive, oxygen, and nitrogen slightly negative. This is a polar molecule. And turns out that polar molecules can do the second intermolecular force, the medium strength one, dipole, dipole. So technically, you can put ammonia and water and all these molecules that hydrogen bond down here too. Because generally, if it can hydrogen bond, it probably is a polar molecule. It can also do dipole, dipole. It can do both. But when you're talking about how sticky is a molecule, how strong are the molecules held together through these intermolecular forces, it's more important to know the strongest force, the hydrogen bonding force. That's the most important force that makes ammonia stick to ammonia. And most of us just kind of disregard that. Oh yeah, it could also do the second force, dipole, dipole. Molecules that possess polar covalent bonds, like the carbon, the chlorine bond is polar covalent and it's not getting canceled out. There's only one chlorine carbon bond. That's a polar molecule because it has only one polar covalent bond. Remember the CH bond, carbon hydrogen is a non-polar covalent bond. You might wanna go back, forget how far ago it was, unit two or unit one where we talked about bonding. And we talked about how to identify polar covalent bonds and non-polar covalent bonds. And we also talked about ionic bonding too. So I'm hoping you go back and look at that and you can decide for yourself that all four of these molecules happen to be polar molecules because their polar covalent bonds do not cancel out. If they're polar, they can do the second intermolecular force, dipole, dipole, medium strength. Um, this molecule is diethyl ether. That was an original anesthet anesthetic, anesthesia. <laughs> That's one knocks you out. Um, because it's sold as a liquid, but it, equally, it quickly vaporizes to a gas. Why quickly? Because this is a medium strength force. It, the molecules are not that sticky. A little bit of heat energy, they separate and go from the liquid into the gas phase. Water, if you leave it on the ground, they'll collect enough heat energy to change the liquid water molecules, the gaseous water molecules, but it takes a lot longer. 
What about if you spill some gasoline on the ground? It vaporizes instantly. Gasoline and other nonpolar molecules, but not very sticky at all. The only way they hold each other together through intermolecular forces is through this van der Waals or London dispersion force. Carbon dioxide is a good example of a nonpolar molecule. And how does it stick together? Well, it's nonpolar, which means you really don't have charges here. Actually, let's not do this one. Let's use I2. That's a little easier to understand. So the I2 molecule looks like this. Iodine, I think, is element number 53. Where's my periodic table? Every chemist should have one, right? Yeah, I do. It's element 53. Yeah. <laughs> if it's element 53 and there's two of them, then there's 53 times two, 106 protons, and there's 106 electrons. And now I'm asking the I2 molecules to stick together. And they're like, no, that's a nonpolar bond. We're sharing fairly. One side of the iodine, the other side of the iodine, there should not be a charge there. Not like in a ammonia molecule where nitrogen's a greedy hog and it's more electronegative and pulling on these bonding electrons, making the hydrogen slightly positive all the time, nitrogen slightly negative. Nope, not the case here. Well, then how are we gonna stick together? Just through randomness. You got 106 electrons that are moving in their orbitals, right? So on average, there should be 53 electrons on this side and 53 electrons on that side. But they're in motion. So as electrons are in motion, what happens if one of them creeps over across the side and for an instant, there's 54 electrons on this side and only 52 over here, just for an instant before the electron circles back and goes back to where it's supposed to. Well, for that very brief instant, you slightly have more electrons on this side than this side. It's called a temporary dipole because electron can go back and most of the time electrons are equally distributed and there's no net charge or no charge separation. But for an instant, it's possible. This side's slightly negative, this side's slightly positive. Well, this nearby iodine is all four of, full of electrons. There's 106 of them. And suddenly the electrons on the surface, the valence electrons sense this positive charge creep up. It's like, well, what was that? And they all move over to feel it. And now some of those electrons moving over here makes this new molecule slightly negative and the other side slightly positive. And for an instant, now this molecule is creeping over to this one. They're attracted together. And it's a fleeting force because eventually the electron go back to where it was and like, there's no net charge here. But for an instant, they're attracted to each other. And that's what happens. And then um, this molecule is slightly negative and slightly positive. So there's another iodide molecule and then a dipole is induced. It's caused to happen. This was neutral and it sends a positive charge. And now some of these electrons move closer. And now the top half of this molecule is slightly negative, the bottom half slightly positive. Another one's close and those electrons are attracted. So this side slightly negative, this side slightly positive. And that's how van der Waals forces it occur. The molecules start attracting each other because these temporary induced dipoles continuously form just through the randomness of the electrons. But it's really weak, right? Because eventually, on average, electrons should be equally dispersed. There should not be any charges. And so there's no net attraction. That makes it the weakest. And all the nonpolar molecules do that. However, what if you have a lot, a lot, a whole bunch of molecules? Well, a gecko is capable of walking on glass on other surfaces. It can go upside down. It doesn't have glue on the pads of its feet. It has a lot of bumps. So here you can zoom in and actually see ridges. What's happening is there's a lot of surface area. The gecko is putting a bunch of its molecules that makes up the pads of its, of its feet, lots and lots of surface area in contact with, in this case, a glass or rock, whatever it's climbing on. And there's lots and lots of molecules. So some of them can induce dipoles in the, with the rock or the glass and induce a temporary dipole and start sticking through van der Waals forces. 
And there's so many molecules that some of them are doing it, some are not, but there's so many that a little bit here, a little bit there, a little bit there, are all sticking together and a little bit adds up. It's capable of holding the gecko on the side of a sheet of glass. Cool. Um, same thing is true for candle wax. Candles are solid at room temperature, but they're made of greasy, waxy materials, nonpolar materials. But it turns out the molecules that make up candle wax are long chains of carbon. They're big molecules, and a long chain has a lot of surface area. So all these molecules that make up candle wax can stack up. And even though this spot and that spot, a little bit of interaction, maybe a little dipole there, but if it happens a lot along the length of the chain, a lot of surface area, all that little sticky force adds up and it holds all the molecules in place to form a rigid candlestick or crayon. And it's pretty easy to melt that, right? Enough heat energy, make these chains vibrate and start folding up or wrinkling up and vibrating. They'll unstick from the neighbors and quickly melt, forming candle wax. Candle wax as a liquid will actually go into the the wick, the little string, soak in there and by capillary action, the liquid candle wax will go up to the top where the flame is and all that heat energy will change the liquid candle wax, the gaseous candle wax. And then as the gas comes off of the, the wick, the little molecules of gaseous candle wax then is in the flame where it's nice and hot. And actually the heat of of the flame can cause the covalent bonds to break down and we can burn the candle wax, do a combustion reaction, change the molecules of candle wax to carbon dioxide and water. Cool. What else do we need to know? Oh yeah, intermolecular force is much weaker, weaker than can, uh, covalent bonding. So remember how I talked about the candle? Um, it was, we didn't break any covalent bonds until the very end using a lot of energy from the heat of the flame. Um, yeah, the intermolecular forces are really, really weak. And so the weakest chain break, you know, the weakest link is the one that breaks. So as you add heat energy, the molecules vibrate. You don't break out pieces of the bonds, the molecules, the atoms don't separate. No, you overcome the intermolecular forces first, they're weaker. So molecules separate from molecules first. Once it's in the gas phase and they're completely separated, that's generally when you can add more heat energy and then the heat energy of vibration or collisions between one molecule and another finally can hit hard enough and break a covalent bond and cause a chemical reaction. Oh, one more application and then we'll end the video. Um, intermolecular forces help us understand why some things dissolve and others don't. So like dissolves like is a nice guideline. So we got water here. And we have another molecule that also has an OH bond. Water has OH bonds. They both can hydrogen bond or H bond, which means they can H bond, hydrogen bond to each other. So if they have the alike intermolecular forces, they should dissolve in one another. Uh, this specific molecule is alcohol found in beer and wine. And so beer and wine is one solution. Water's dissolved with ethanol, ethyl alcohol because they both hydrogen bond and they can hydrogen bond stick to each other. What about over here? A complete hydrocarbon, a molecule containing only carbon and hydrogen, hydrocarbon. Um, the CH bond is nonpolar covalent. A carbon-carbon bond is nonpolar covalent, right? There's no difference in electronegativity there. And carbon and hydrogen share fairly. There's not enough difference in electronegativity to make it polar covalent. No, um, this molecule is actually butane. It's the liquid in cigarette lighters. You flick the bic, <laughs> start the, the cigarette lighter, and the liquid turns to a gas instantly. It's actually under pressure inside the little um, cigarette lighter to keep it a liquid. And once you relieve the pressure, room temperature is enough energy that make the liquid molecules separate from each other and turn into a gas. And then you spark it, ignite those gas molecules, do a combustion reaction and start, start a flame. Um, yeah, this is a nonpolar molecule. It only does van der Waals or London dispersion forces, very weak. This molecule has polar covalent bonds, but it's a symmetrical molecule and the, co um, the polar covalent bonds cancel out. 
making a nonpolar molecule. This is also a greasy, waxy, oily molecule. It used to be a dry cleaning solvent. Works great. Um, like dissolves like, so this greasy solvent, liquid, can easily dissolve other oils and waxes and grease. So it can clean your clothes and it doesn't use water, so it dries really easily. The problem is carbon tetrachloride is bad for the environment, so they've outlawed it. Um, you can use um, supercritical carbon dioxide. So if you heat up and you pressurize carbon dioxide, you can force it to be a liquid and be a solvent. Carbon dioxide is also nonpolar. These bonds are polar covalent, just like these bonds. Carbon is less electronegative than the, the chlorine, but they all cancel out. Same is true with carbon dioxide. It's linear. The bonds cancel out. It's also nonpolar. And so now supercritical carbon dioxide is a substitute um, at some dry cleaning places, because if you release it, well, CO2 in the atmosphere is not great, right? Could, might be contributing to global warming, definitely contributing to um, greenhouse gases. So we're trying not to let that leak out, but it's not toxic unless it's displacing all the oxygen in a room. It's a good dry cleaning solvent. Light dissolves like. This is nonpolar, greases are nonpolar, they dissolve in each other. My dad was a mechanic. He used to wash his hands in gasoline. Well, they outlawed that, or at least said that's a bad idea because there's molecules in gasoline that might cause cancer. Yikes. Dad, don't do that. Um, if you try and mix a nonpolar greasy molecule with water that's polar, they're not alike. That's when water wants to do hydrogen bonding. It's very polar. The greasy molecule here is nonpolar. It wants to do London dispersion. And these are different forces. They're not alike. So we predict they don't dissolve in each other. And this actually explains why carbon, carbonated soft drinks, soda pop, goes flat. At the bottling company, they pressurize. They force the gaseous carbon dioxide to dissolve in the root beer, in the Coca-Cola, the Pepsi, whatever soft drink you like, and keep it under pressure in the bottle or the can. And we open it. The nonpolar carbon dioxide molecule says, I'm not going to be dissolved in here. I'm not like water, which can hydrogen bond. And it starts, starts bubbling out, starts leaving, out gases, and it goes flat. Cool. That is enough for now. Take care.